Hello and welcome to Baseball Barbacast, the only baseball podcast in the world that will never cease being good. I'm Jake Mintz. That's Jordan Schusterman. And we have a show and a half for you today. You know, in these lead ups to the season, we're doing division previews and it's like, what's going to happen that is going to throw us off schedule sometimes for the best possible reason on this special bonus Thursday edition. We are, of course, going to be talking about the Padres massive decision to trade (laughs) prospects, including some they just got (laughs) for Dylan Cease. But the second half of the show is even more special to us in particular because we will be interviewing the recently retired Mike Zanino. But before we get to Mike, let's get into this trade, Jake. This is how it always works, right? Of course, we do the NOS preview yesterday, and I'm glad I snuck in that one line saying, hey, you know, the Padres might still be in on cease. Well, last night, we finally get the news. The Jeff Passan all caps breaking we've all been waiting for. Dylan Cease is finally been traded. and He is going to the San Diego Padres. Who could have seen it coming? Only uh, everybody for months. <laughs> Can, okay, so I actually want to start with, listen, I think we all knew Cease was going to get traded. Okay, sure, they could have held on to him until the deadline, but... No, that was not going to be a smart thing to do, right? How many pitchers do you need to see go down that you weren't expecting to go down? Sure, Dylan Cease hasn't missed a start in four or five years. They knew they had to trade him before opening day, and that became very clear over the last week. So the White Sox trading Dylan Cease, not at all surprising. Well, I want to talk about the Pedro Graffol tweet, Mm -hmm. uh, tweet, the Pedro (laughs) Graffol quote. Mm -hmm. So the manager of the White Sox, Pedro Graffol, was asked whether he thought Dylan Cease was going to be the opening day starter, and he responded, quote, I don't know. I mean, how am I supposed to know that? I don't know what's going to happen out there. The idea that Griffol's like, how am I supposed to know? My guy, we're not asking you about like international geopolitics or, you know, engineering a bridge like you or like the Royals. Like we are asking you about the baseball team that you manage. Yeah. Um, it's, and it's whether like, your best pitcher will still be there in a week. It feels like something you should know about. It's like one of the most basic questions. If you're power ranking questions you ask managers during spring training, who's starting on opening day is pretty high on the list, <laughs> especially in the middle of March. We're not that far away from opening day. Right. But that non-answer kind of spoke volumes that a trade was getting more and more likely and Cease will be on his way to the San Diego Padres. Jordan, let's do this. Read out the trade in full. We'll talk about the prospects going back to the White Sox in this deal. Talk about their angle, and then we'll hop into the Padres side of things and how this fits into the Soto trade and the sure. financial element. Sure. So Dylan Cease, who has two years remaining uh, on his contract, I believe he is set to make around $8 million this year. Uh, which is relevant to the larger Padres conversation, I'm sure, is going to the San Diego Padres for four players. Uh, That includes three prospects, and that's certainly who we'll focus on here. Two pitching prospects, the first of which they just got in the Juan Soto trade from the New York Yankees. That is Drew Thorpe, uh, who was one of the best pitchers in minor league baseball last year and looked fantastic this spring. By the way, the Drew Thorpe Padres spring training jersey, if you can get a hand on one of those. That thing's yeah. going to go hard, all right? And it's, I'm just saying, if that is that is a piece of merch I would love to have if someone could find one for me. Um, a Coachella must. Yes, exactly. Uh, so Drew Thorpe uh, is, is the first, certainly, I think, the most high-profile name, especially since he's already been. I mean, how many pe- prospects have been in two massive <laughs> blockbusters in the same offseason? That feels like a, a special achievement. Uh, the two other prospects, Jairo Iriarte. This is someone who really burst last year. Uh, a pitcher who, you know, again, the Padres have done a tremendous job at, in all avenues of, of you know talent acquisition on the amateur side. And he was someone that was not necessarily a, a big deal when he signed originally out of Venezuela. But the last couple seasons, it has really popped. And while he is not, uh, he's, he's a slender, slender, slender lad. But my goodness, does he throw hard. One of the most electric, you know, arsenals in all of minor league baseball last year. Nearly 13 Ks per nine. And to the point where at the end of last season... 
when the pot they were talking about bringing him up at the end of last season, which I know sounds ridiculous because the Padres were actually technically still in the mix <laughs> at the end of last year. And uh, as we know, the Padres are, are have no no problem rushing their prospects. So he, as a 21 year old last yeah. year, was already considered possibly big league ready, at least as a reliever. Now we can assume the White Sox will continue to develop as, as a starter. And then who's the last guy? And then Samuel Zavala. Samuel Zavala, uh, an outfielder who is still only 19 until July. He's someone who at this time last year, coming off a season where he reached A ball as a 17-year-old, had a ton of buzz. Last season, he reaches high A as an 18-year-old. It's it's a very advanced approach. Walked 94 times as an 18 year old, uh, mostly all in a ball. So that alone is very impressive. The question with him is: Is he a center fielder? How much power is there really? He's also kind of a small guy. But there's, I mean, again, it's a long road to get there. You got to develop a talent like this. It's not just going to happen. He's like in that sweet spot of there's a lot of reason to be excited, but you don't exactly know what you're getting. But that is a is a big upside swing. That is a lottery ticket if you've ever seen one and someone who already reached high A as an 18-year-old. So, again, those are reasons to be excited. And then Steven Wilson. Poor Steven Wilson, who was probably all packed for Korea, is now having to pack to for, for Camelback Ranch. Um, now, so let, let's let's yeah. touch on Stephen Wilson very yeah. briefly. Yeah, uh, career grinder, reliever, played winter ball, and the the worst part of this deal for him, in my opinion, if you go to Korea, like if you make that roster, MLB play pays players for the schlep, right? Because in order to incentivize like the union and the PA to agree to do these games, players are paid; they're compensated for that. And the number we heard is like it is like tens of thousands of dollars yeah. to go over to Korea and play these games. Let me, yeah. Stephen Wilson, yeah, like that's a guy who could have used fifty grand. Yeah, that's true. However, here, here's here's what I'm going to push back on that. Stephen Wilson is now in a great position to be the closer of the Chicago White Sox. Which, if he can rack up even like fifteen big league saves. He's making up that money in arbitration in a couple of years. Now, now it's true. true. It'd be nicer to just have the money, uh, you know, in a couple of weeks when you when you get back from Seoul. And I imagine this is certainly a, a big vibe shift here. Uh, but uh, he'll be OK. He'll be OK. See, Stephen Wilson, again, an Ali Dome legend as well. I'm sure he's going to enjoy his the higher le- higher leverage. He has one career save, I guess. But that, that, that those leverage innings, even for a bad team, are definitely going up. So the question whenever a deal like this happens is how they do. Right. And it is both a good question and a dumb question because we really will not know how they do for a number of years. But what we can do is compare this haul to other trades for similar players that have happened recently. And the obvious one here is Corbin Burns, right? The Orioles acquiring Corbin Burns one year of Corbin Burns in exchange for Dale Hall, a left handed hard throwing pitcher who's probably a reliever, maybe a starter, and Joey Ortiz, who uh, looks like a an everyday infielder. Jordan, a very simple question is would you rather have the hall the uh Padres gave up or the hall the Brewers gave up? I think or the Orioles gave up. Yeah, yeah. Again, and it's it's different circumstances, of course, because not just the you know, one year versus two years, but what these teams were trying to accomplish, right? The Brewers were not going to trade for an 18-year-old outfielder if they were going to trade Corbin Burns, right? That was not going to happen. So these teams had very different goals here. And so I think I lean slightly towards San Diego's, or sorry, towards Chicago's side. I just think that Iriarte, to me, is, is the key to this even more than Zavala because Thorpe is a pretty safe Again, we don't know exactly what the ceiling is, but like he's going to throw a lot of big league innings this year, and you kind of know what you're getting. Iriarte could range in a lot of different directions in an exciting way, in a concerning way. And again, (laughs) this is the other thing is I'm thinking about the context. I mean, I trust the Brewers to get the most out of D.L. Hall more than the White Sox to get the most out of anybody. Right. And so that leaves yeah. me stuck with thinking I'm, I'm already thinking about these players in different ways. But for White Sox fans, I will say I think they did quite well here. I really do. I think they did solidly. I think there is like there is a lack of obvious upside here, especially when you compare it to the other prospects the Padres could have given up. And in talking to people who've seen that system quite a bit, there's a preference for 
Robbie Snelling and Dylan Lesko. Now, were the Padres willing to give those guys up? That's a different conversation. <laughs> I but, clearly no. I mean, clearly I no. would guess they asked about Dylan Lesko and Robbie Snelling. Like, I would, I would take that as a, as a, as something of a definitive answer. And as we've learned with the Padres in general, right? Like, who is untouchable? You know, we always assume certain guys are more untouchable than others. I mean, Jackson Merrill, it's possible he was on the table two months ago and it just didn't quite line up, right? And then he comes out, has an awesome spring, and now he's the center fielder. So these things change all the time. Um, but to your point, I, I mean, yeah, I, I think that's that's fair. Like, yes, there's higher upside prospects in the Padres system. That doesn't make these players not good. It just means the Padres system is ridiculous. Right. I do think that there is, like, White Sox fans should feel... Fine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, uh, I don't again, we think don't know. This is, I want to be clear. Yeah. No, 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 I just want to be clear. I don't think this is like a day of celebration, <laughs> Yeah, is I guess my point. Because well, well, is any day it, was just, a White Sox fan a day of celebration? I mean, honestly, like <laughs> at this point, we all knew the trade was coming. I mean, sure, I guess they could have landed a top 10 prospect and everyone was like, this is a franchise pillar. But no version of this trade. We're not going to know, as you said that at the top, right? So I, I agree with you. That's my point. Yeah. Is that like, yeah. I, I just... I'm not saying that people are acting this way, okay? But like when you trade away a player like this, that's a bad day, right? That you have a that the organization that the franchise has allowed itself to get into a position sure. where trading away Dylan Cease is seen as a necessity. Oh, that's course. not a good thing. Of now, course. maybe yes, like accepting the circumstances where you're currently in and making the most of that is is positive. I have like we need to see whether this new White Sox player development apparatus is going to turn these players into good players, into good big leaguers. We haven't seen it yet. It's a new regime uh, full well, of old royals. I was going to say it's employees. a new regime and it's not, right? I mean, Chris Getz was literally the farm director. So that's yeah. the thing. That's where the skepticism comes in. But I, I understand what you're saying. I think that they did quite well. But I think we have to flip this to the Padres side. And before we get to Dylan Cease, the pitcher who's on the Padres now, Let's get to the other element of, oh, my God, like all these tweets over the last day. Can't believe the Padres pulled it off. I can. not I can. Like, how many yeah. times do we have to watch them do this? And how many times do we have to watch them throw their hands up and say, listen, OK, fine. You, all you people want to just pass up on this ridiculously talented player. All right. Sure. I mean, they've done it. What now? Like 10 times over the last three seasons. And and because they're so good at, at acquiring, you know, that younger talent and flipping them at the at sometimes the right time, at sometimes the wrong time. I mean, you've traded away this many prospects. Some of them are going to come back and make you look pretty stupid. I mean, they certainly have their handful of those. And maybe there will be some of those in this, too. But in the grand scheme of things, this was a situation where we knew, we just talked about it yesterday, that they had so many innings to cover going into this year. They lost, and by the way, trading away Stephen Wilson, that's another 50 innings out the door. Nearly half of the innings from last year were gone. And what they had done so far was creative, but didn't actually seem like enough. This, even yep. when you're trading Drew Thorpe, who might have helped this year, looks a lot more like, okay, now we've actually sufficiently backfilled what we've lost in a very real way. Because Dylan sees posts. That's another thing, right? Pitcher injuries, who knows? It's a crapshoot. It's roulette. But like, this is a guy who starts games and has stayed healthy as well as a pitcher can. You say like this idea that the the people are shocked. The, they can keep getting away with this. They can. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> they, they are. Let's not be surprised that AJ Preller keeps doing it. And, and by the way, I saw a tweet suggesting that Preller saw Cease, Cease pitched yesterday. Um, and this was from someone in San Diego. So I could be wrong, but this was just total, you know, BS rumor, but I'm just going to run with it anyway, because I think it's just a funny scenario and not that implausible. But I love the idea that Preller watched Cease last night and watched Yamamoto get blasted by the Mariners <laughs> and was like, you know what? Screw it. Like, let's do it. Why Nailed not? It. Like, we, <laughs> let's not that it's like this move is going to push the, push the Dodgers that much. But like, we talked about it yesterday. Like, there's still too many good players on this team to punt on this season. And while you could say, well, well then why did they trade Juan Soto? Clearly, they were operating under a situation where either they were going to hold Juan Soto and do absolutely nothing because that was the financial situation they were working under, or they were going like a few other teams, like Seattle, like some other teams we've seen this winter. It's like, all right, listen, here's the budget you're working with. Do whatever you want, but that's what you're working with. And I, I, I want to also mention, you know, the the one sixty hundred sixty million dollar uh, number you referenced yesterday on Fangraphs. Like that is, I, I guess, like exact salaries for this year. The luxury tax payroll is much closer 
to the the luxury tax line because their AAVs for all of their ridiculous extensions is so much higher than what these guys are actually making this year. So they they didn't have as much. 160 is not as much. You know, 167 is maybe what the players are making this year. It's much closer to the line. I think that's an important number to consider when you think about how much flexibility they actually had in making this move. I think now it puts their their luxury payroll up to. 224, right? 225. Again, this is, you know, via Fangraphs roster resource, which is incredible. And we could not do our jobs without it. But yeah, so I, I would just say that that is something to consider too. Like clearly the Padres had a little bit of room to work with and they decided that trading Soto was going to be the only way to have a competitive team this year and have enough pitchers. And I think you kind of see that. I wouldn't want to trade Juan Soto. And I'm sure AJ Preller didn't want to because he's the guy that's trades for Juan Soto, right? You could imagine that kind of person, that kind of GM doesn't want to trade him away. But that's the situation that they work with. And I, I think it's I think it's pretty exciting that they're going for it again. We'll get back to Preller in a second. Let's just talk about Cease. So what type of pitcher is this? I think I've seen this a bunch online so far in the last 12 hours. The idea that he's a right-handed like Snell. Um, yeah. I mean, he is like pretty much he's I, I mean, yeah, like he's he's similarly frustrating in that he works deep counts and throws a lot of pitches and doesn't work excessively deep into games as much as some other pitch to contact more pitch to contact oriented starters. His he's a two pitch guy. I mean, he has a curveball, but it's mostly fastball slider. The slider is the pitch, right? And as is the case often with guys who have awesome sliders. The best version of that includes a lot of sliders outside the strike zone, which often leads to takes, which leads to deep counts, which leads to high pitch counts, right? And so that is kind of like the the Snell comparison, even though Snell has, you know, four pitches. Um, you look confused. No, no, you're totally right. And that's that's where the kind of the comparison, I think, falls off a bit is that, I mean, the reason Cease can get away with essentially two pitches, and he, it's not as much as like what we've seen from Strider, but I mean, the slider is yeah. one of the best pitches in baseball, right? So, I mean, all of Snell's stuff is really good. Uh, but Cease's slider is, I mean, by run value, I think it was the best pitch in baseball last year, even amongst a disappointing season, right? Like, he yeah. is absurdly talented. <laughs> and and when you compare that with the bulk and making third stars, that's something that Snell hasn't had, right? And he's, and, and the, I would say that the question now is, you know, we saw Snell kind of it's, it's it's weird because it's like okay he had his best season and he maximized in San Diego but he also was still walking everybody so how Cease changes under pitching coach Ruben Niebla I'm super fascinated by but Cease the personality Cease the pitcher I'm just a huge fan I'm buying in like that's why I, I really like this for San Diego I just I just think again not not to mention that they clearly needed it like they needed it as much as as almost anybody here. Um, he, the upside is absolutely still present and it's two years, right? They, they have two years with him too, which is, which is also a, a, an exciting opportunity because I'm sure they were kicking around deals for Burns, you know, and Bieber and some of the other one, uh, one year guys, but having him with two also makes this a little bit easier to swallow. Yeah. Last three years for C's, he was solid in 2021, amazing in 2022, where he kind of outpitched his peripherals. I mean, he had a two, two ERA and led the league in walks. If we want to talk about Snell esque. It's the same okay, thing. And then yeah, yeah. it's the same thing. Finished second in the Cy Young, and then last year it was kind of the opposite. Like he was almost unlucky. Like he had a three seven two fifth, and his <laughs> ERA was four five eight. Yes, and his walks were still you know just as high, if not higher, on a rate basis. So yeah, the walks and all that I stuff. Think, is, I, I just want to say, what's what else? What is also different? The defense. I mean, the White Sox defense is about as was about as bad as it could be last year. And the Padres, while they have some weird stuff going on, it should still be an upgrade. Even if Jackson, I mean, I guess if oh. Jackson Merrill is a complete catastrophe in center, that's something. But no, this defense is way better, way better. Yeah. I mean, Hassan Kim is a gold glover, mm -hmm. and Mayna Machado is still very, very good, and Tatis is is a banger in right field. Like that already is better than what the White Sox were. Hopefully Bogarts can play second. <laughs> I assume hopefully can. Bogarts can play second. <laughs> but we'll yeah. see. We'll see. So C specifically, I like it. I think he provides dependability with a whole lot of upside. I think he's better than he was last year. I don't think he's as good as he was in 2022. But if you start Dylan Cease in game two of a postseason series, like you feel good about that. Yep. Right. I'm totally fine with that. Yep. I don't think he's in the top, top, top tier of starters. You could easily see a scenario where he is better than Blake Snell in 2024. Um, and he has the one thing Snell does not have right now, and that is a baseball team. Uh, <laughs> let's say. quickly talk <laughs> about A.J. Preller. 
and how he fits into this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is we've again. I've had this conversation a hundred times now about him because he's made so many deals. Uh, but at this point, when you have again, clearly he was in lockstep with Peter Seidler, and when Seidler passed away, we we no matter how wh- whatever the new ownership was going to kind of be communicating, and and, and I, not that I don't believe that they don't kind of believe in Preller and want to stick with him. At some point, there needs to be a little bit more consistency in terms of the major league success. And we had that taste of in 2022. Is he firmly on the chopping block? Maybe that's a bit of a stretch. But I still do think that he has acted with aggression. That is not an accident. And he knows that, like, listen, Samuel Zavala, bless his heart. It's cool that we, you know, signed him and watched him flourish into this cool prospect. I need the guy that can help. He's acted like the whole time. He's always done this, right? The Soto deal yeah. was, uh, it's like, oh, well, then why would you trade Soto? That was clearly just the situation that he was in. And so it's not surprising that he went out of his way to still make sure he shows everybody, we are going for it. Our team is good enough. And we'll see if it, if I'm going to be here to see this out, if the ownership wants to, to stick with me or go in another direction by the end of the season, depending on how it goes. And he had that had that right and, and ownership let him do it. And, and I'm, I'm uh, yeah. you know, respect uh, them for, for being on the same page enough to, to go for it like this. But the circumstances have changed for him. Like yeah. Preller was given an abnormal amount of leash, right? Like a That's crazy for a amount long of leash time. <laughs> for a long time, <laughs> relatively. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it, it was different. He was given more. That is not going to be the case anymore because the ownership situation right. has shifted. We assume. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Guy. But I'm, I, Maybe that's, that's he's – my sense. Yes. Yeah. But what I'm saying is mm-hmm. – you can see a scenario. It's much more like possible that the Padres win 73 games and they can't <laughs> Preller. Like that is much more realistic now than it was like a year ago. Yeah. Right. And so because of that, he's not living for tomorrow. Like this is <sighs> it. Never has right? been. Yeah. Never has been. And so I Preller is one of the most fascinating characters in baseball for me because he is so clearly elite at an important aspect of being a GM. He can identify talent at in the minor league level, and he can convince other teams to th- that his prospects are good, right? Those two things are valuable, and he has shown that to be a repeatable skill. There are some things that A.J. Preller is very bad at, in my opinion, and that is like communication and setting like a stable culture in an organization and player development sometimes and depth building depth not good at that however i think that like in this particular context of this particular trade it's an example of his skill set working to the team's advantage yeah and by the way if if preller is thinking i am going to be here forever uh he can also think well guess what i can replace Zavala, Iriarte, and Thorpe uh, in a year, you know, a year from now, there's going to be some prospect that they took in the eighth round or some, you know, hard throwing, you know, lefty from Venezuela. That's like one of the top prospects in baseball because that's just what they've done. Right. Um, now, again, it's only translated to a very limited amount of major league success so far. And that's why that's the standard we should be holding them to. But that's the other thing he's thinking is, listen, as much as it hurts to trade these guys, we got another wave coming and they have another wave that we already know about that's still there. So yeah. the Padres eternally, eternally fascinating. All right, Jake, before we get to Mike Zanino, quick other bit of news that is pretty significant. By the way, Mike Zanino is on this podcast, so we should... Oh, cool, cool, cool. cool. So I'm excited for that. Uh, Devin Williams, another less um, exciting Jeff Passan bit of news last night. Devin Williams, the closer for the Brewers, will be out for a couple months with a back uh, fractures, fractures in his back. That sounds horrible. That is kind of injury where I'm like, how is that only two months? I don't understand at all. That um, is a great point. Like sometimes I, you get injuries and it's like, this guy's out for four months. Like, what was it when like Mike Trout missed four months with like a calf yeah, the, problem? <laughs> right. I was like, get right. back out here. <laughs> right. Meanwhile, Devin right. Williams is like two months with a back fracture. Well, well, like, I, you should quit. The, the you ridic- should retire. The ridiculous thing is we had like hints about this when he reported this recently and Pat Murphy was like, ah, he'll be fine. Like the scan didn't show anything. And then he got a second opinion. They're like, yeah, yeah, you have, you have a stretch fracture in your back. Uh, so you're going to not pitch for the next couple of months. Um, I mean, this is simple. It's really just, it adds to the intrigue of this brewer season. Devin Williams, you know, we said, okay, they trade Corbin Burns. They're still going for it. But what does that look like? It's going to be a lot of young guys. Oh, they still have Devin Williams. Are they going to trade him? Are they going to trade Willie Adamas? 
Can they still win without Devin Williams? Yes, but my goodness, has he been so important to their entire operation that while they do have all kinds of randos in the bullpen that will probably be awesome, like Trevor McGill and Joel Piamps, go check out Joel Piamps' baseball savant page. I, I just want to throw that out there, people. Go, go, go take a little gander at that. You know, Abner Rebe also, you know, throws 103. They have guys, but this is a this is a big deal. So I don't know. It's not like they can go sign an all-world closer. Um, then I don't know how this impacts the trade value. That's another part of this too. But uh, it's big news, so we are acknowledging it. All right. Let's move on. It's time. To the moment we <laughs> and very few other people have been waiting for. And that is our conversation <laughs> yes. with the one and the only Mike Sunino. Yes. So Mike Sunino uh, recently announced his retirement as – I think a good amount of you know he's uh, been one of certainly my favorite players, but collectively someone that has become very important to the BBQ brand, uh, if you'll call it, by accident. Um, but he's also an awesome, awesome dude and someone we've run into down the line and we've said, oh, we'd love to get you on the podcast. This felt like a fitting time. Had some technical difficulties along the way, so it's not necessarily the, the best quality interview we've ever done, but we're so glad we were able to make it happen and we hope uh, that the listeners enjoy it because we enjoyed it and uh, Mike's a great dude. So hopefully you enjoy this interview with Mike Sanito, who is good, of course, uh, and we'll be back oh. at the end to, uh, to uh, wrap it up. Uh, enjoy our conversation with Mike Z. And welcome back to Baseball Barbecast. We are now very excited to be joined by a very special guest. Jake, it's as good as it gets. It's Mike Sanino. Mike Sanino, welcome to Baseball Barbecast. This is a long time coming. Uh, you just recently announced your retirement. First and foremost, congratulations. How are you feeling? You are a retired Major League Baseball player. How are you feeling? <laughs> First, thank you. I feel great. You know, it's one of those things where... Uh, you know, I, I can remember the beginning of it all like it was yesterday. So to think, uh, you know, is you know, 11 seasons and everything that's happened in between, it's been awesome. Um, but the game takes a toll on you sometimes, and it's one of those things where I, I couldn't ask for uh, it to go any other way. I've been able to experience a lot. So just, just very grateful and blessed for how it all turned out. And we're not getting like a Brett Favre, Roger Clemens – style thing where like every <laughs> june it's like oh z's back like we have a decade of you you know going to play for the vikings and whatever no you, you know what it, it was one of those things once once you know february rolled around i just i got like a little bit of antsiness knowing i should be doing something when when it's part of your life for that long i can look back to even how the last couple spring trainings were and what i was just trying to do in spring training to make sure the body was ready to go into 162 uh and i think i maybe got 40 games each one of those two seasons um but it's one of those things where it's uh it's just so instilled in you what what you do in the off seasons what you do in spring trainings uh even my wife was saying you know it, we're usually you know hustling around packing the kids up packing the cars up so we're wired in a way where that time uh you know one it's fun for us and two you know it, it's a big part of getting to the season but uh no right now it is uh I'm, I'm happy the body's feeling great. So uh, it, it's just going on enjoying uh, uh, following baseball as a fan. When you're a pro baseball player, the rhythm of your life is the same like every year. And so when you talk about getting ready to go to spring, like your body clock, like your muscle memory is like, all right, time to pack up the car. Is there something that you're looking forward to doing over the summer, whether that's like july 4th or being at someone's birthday in mid-may like are there anything or like any activities that you never got to do because you spent your whole summers playing ball yeah i, I was just say so you know my wife myself and my daughter were our birthdays all are at the end of march my son's you know mid midway through april so being around for those birthdays you know as you start to grow a family you know and you realize you know, i think opening day has been on my wife's birthday a couple of times. Uh, not ideal for, for, you know, <laughs> that stuff, but, um, you know, like, like just seeing those things. Yeah. I being injured the last couple of years, I was back for a couple of July fours and you're just like, man, like, this is, uh, I could see why the big deal of it, uh, you know, for, for everybody else. And it's fun to be playing on those days. Uh, you know, the nostalgia of, you know, baseball on the 4th of July is, uh, it, it is hard to beat. Um, but I, I was, you know, out back at my brother-in-law's last night. It's like 60, it was like 63 degrees and we were hanging out. And I was just like, my one brother-in-law goes, man, this would be a perfect night for Sunday night baseball. I was like, I don't know what that's like, you know, to be able to sit back, weather's nice, throw on a game and relax. You're either playing in it or you're traveling. 
you know, so I'm just looking forward to doing that and, and, you know, taking a step back and watching baseball as a fan because the last couple of years, you know, there's been some positive changes in the game, but, you know, it's a whirlwind. Once that season starts, there's no stopping it. Jordan, I know exactly what you were about to say, which is the Rays and Mariners were not often put on Sunday night baseball. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's definitely true. Uh, but that that's, that actually was not what I was going to say. I was just going to say, as you were describing, you know, that scene and, and you know, Jake's kind of looking ahead to the summer, but even right now, right? Like <laughs> as a catcher, and we're going to get into life as a catcher and what makes being a catcher so difficult in the major leagues. And I think you're obviously qualified to talk about that, but Catchers are so busy in spring training in particular. I mean, you're not only are you having to meet like a hundred new people and learn all these different pitchers, but you're the one catching the bullpen. You're the one hauling your bags all over the place. I I watched you do this a year ago in Cleveland spring training, you know, like this. It's nice to probably just hang out and be like, oh, man, I don't have to do all my catcherly duties anymore. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's something I thoroughly enjoy. I think, you know, the thing that you miss the most and, you know, I can talking to people that have retired that have walked away from the game on their terms, you know, what you miss is you miss the camaraderie. You miss, you know, you miss the clubhouse feel. And, you know, you could be 32, 33, you could be 45, you know, you're still going to miss it when you walk away. Um, but I think it's unique for, you know, obviously my position, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you go in and it's like, you're, you're not only meeting, you know, maybe the 15 potential pitchers on the team, you're miss- meeting 25 of them. And uh, you want that relationship to be there. Um, it's a part I thoroughly enjoyed about it, working with the pitching uh, side of it, working with pitching coaches, working with bullpen coaches. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate, you know, my four years in, in, in Tampa taught me a lot. And then it was awesome going back to Cleveland last year, being able to rekindle, you know, with Carl Willis and be able to catch up with a guy that was my original pitching coach when I first got called up. Um, but seeing how the games changed, you know, uh, every year was a new learning experience. Technology's advanced it. Uh, scouting reports have advanced it. Um, it's just, it's just sort of turned everything, uh, you know, in a different direction, which I don't think is bad, but it's more in depth. So just one last thing you talk about what you'll miss. So I played like mediocre division three baseball, right? And when I walk by a field and there are people playing, I feel no itch. But if I'm on a charter bus on the way to like a wedding, oh my God, do I miss ball? Right. Like that, those are the moments that, that you, that you miss. It's, it's less about like the playing of the sport and obviously you miss that too, but it's like all the ancillary stuff around it. Right. Like the feeling of being on a bus and it's like, you look around and everyone's in a suit and you're like, what, like, we sh- what are we doing here? Like someone put on a movie. Yeah. I, I think, you know, you're going to go through all those levels, you know, I, you haven't flown anywhere yet, but I'm sure the first time you hop on a plane, you're like, man, you know, X amount of time I was spent on a plane traveling around the country just to go do, you know, what I've loved. Uh, you know, so those little things that, you know, uh, you're not used to. Um, but yeah, like, like so far, you know, I've been able to, you know, stay busy. You know, my, my son is into baseball. Um, I'm very lucky with that. Um, so it's one of those things I can just, you know, I, I'm living it through him. Any itch I have to go do it, I can go throw on BP or play catch with them. But, you know, it's, it's been nice. I mean, I think the biggest thing is, over the last couple of years is getting my body back to a point where I'll be able to continue to do that. And, um, you know, that's, that's the wear and tear of the job. It's what we, uh, what, what, the reason why we were able to do it for so long, but at the same time too, uh, to be able to, you know, move on in advance and be able to have your health too. So we want to do definitely some some reflecting on your major career, but I, I want to go back, you know, a lot farther than that. This is a question we like to ask a lot of big leaguers at any stages of their career because at some point you kind of realize, like, oh, I'm I'm a little bit better than than my friends, um, and so I'm curious for you. I know growing up in a baseball family as well, when did you kind of realize? How old were you when you're like, all right, like baseball is going to be my thing? I might be a little bit better than everyone else around. Yeah, you know, I I played. Up until my freshman year of high school, I was like, we had a catcher that played uh, D1, went to FGCU, so I played shortstop that year. I wasn't, I wasn't a, a big guy, you know, even going into Florida, you know, um, you know, and then I went in, I had some really good years in high school, um, thought I knew the window where I was going to get drafted at, and um, that passed, you know, ended up going to the 30th round, wasn't offered a dime by Oakland, and then, you know, went to Florida, and it almost brought me back to reality because the area I played in, you know, we, we faced a guy maybe throwing mid to upper eighties and it was a good starter. 
And then I got to UF and I mean, we're, we got guys from Miami and Tampa and Orlando throwing 95. And I was like, this knocked me back down to reality. But what it did at that point challenged me. Um, I battled some injuries my freshman year and towards the end, I started having some really good at bats going into my sophomore year, stuff started piecing together. And I think that's when the confidence really took off for me. Um, I sort of knew who I was as a catcher, as a player. And, um, you know, it, it was probably bit later when I for sure thought that it could be something I really could really could do. So I think I think that's a good transition actually as we move into your major league career because something that I, of course as as you know and and you know Mariners fans like myself know like your development and story was expedited, right? Like that was a big part of it. It, it went faster than most players especially when we talk about for a catcher and all the things that go along with that. And so you just mentioned that experience of sh- you know showing up to UF and being like, "Oh my god, this is a little bit different than high school baseball." I imagine there was some level of that when you get to the major leagues in in a year, you know, and that adjustment, let alone the responsibilities behind the plate. So what was that like? Because for most people, it's not like we're going to talk to a baseball player that says, man, I wish I spent more time in the minors. But in your case, I'm curious what that experience was like for that to all happen that quickly and then to really find your footing at the big league level over over the stretch of a few years. Yeah, I would say like reflecting on that, you know, my biggest thing was I was bit more stubborn and knowing my ability and just trusting what I was doing early on. I, I was confident of how I could manage the pitching staff. Um, I felt pretty good with that, uh, you know, but I feel like getting rushed up there, you know, sometimes people always want to either put a stamp on you or do that. But I mean, I remember clear as day and I don't know if I ever told Raul this story, Raul Ibanez, but I mean, I would walk down in there and it's like Raul Ibanez, Jason Bay, like all these guys are watching film you know, in the film room of their swing. And I was just like, you know, I had an approach in college. I was stubborn with it. I knew what I was going to do. It may not have been the prettiest swing, but I would go up there and compete. But I'm watching these guys I grew up watching in the playoffs, watching on these great teams. And I'm like, well, they're watching their, you know, how are they breaking down their swing? And I sort of floated that way. And I, I put too much thought into it instead of just trusting my ability. It wasn't their fault. It was me being green and uh, not knowing what 162 looked like, not really ever having a film room to, break film down. I mean, it was, it was before all this data was out there and, um, you know, going back there, it was overwhelming in that sense. You know, I had a great guy and I always tell, but Kyle Seager was the guy that took me under his wing. And, um, you want to talk about a guy that watches too much film. It was him, but, um, you know, but he, he helped me with that. He helped me find the balance. Um, but as a young kid that always was able to work hard, um, you know, I think sometimes I put myself behind the eight ball doing too much, and then, you know, almost driving myself into the ground a little bit as, you know, before games putting work in. If you think Kyle Seeger watches a lot of film, oh, his little brother is like a whole <laughs> other hemisphere of watching film. Yeah, yeah. I went up there. I went up there to North Carolina in like 2015, 2016. And the guy he was hitting with, uh, Kyle was like, fly up, you know, like, well, he'll take a look at your swing, like, stay with me. So my wife and I drove up and we went up there. And he comes up and Kyle and I were hitting like Thursday through a Sunday and Kyle and I are going, working on stuff. They're telling us drills to do and it's taken us a few rounds to get it. And he tells Corey to do like one thing and Corey all of a sudden comes up and, you know, does it in the first three swings. Then he goes out of town for two days and comes back on Sunday or Saturday and does exactly what he was doing two days ago. And I'm like, I mean, some guys like Kyle would say, some guys just got it. Like he, he was able to pick up those cues apply it right away um you know and that's why he's the player he is you know he's very attentive but he can apply those changes and make them you know natural rather quickly yeah it's like it's one thing to understand a concept but it's another to have almost like the athletic intelligence to immediately put it into action and that is a a split like in the big leagues right there are some guys who are athletic and they can do the move but they don't know why they can do the move and having talked to people about Se- like Corey Seager, he is the guy who very much understands how yeah. and why the inner machinations of his specific move. I want to hop back to, to what you were talking about before. When you got to the big leagues, the sense I get is that the offensive side of the game for you was more of a challenge than the defensive side. Was there any, like when you got there, did you feel ready to go as a catcher? Yeah, I, I felt like, you know, that was something I could always put in. And 
um, like I said, the game was the game was different then um, in terms of how the catching position even got evaluated. You know, it was receiving. You know, was there, but it was it wasn't quantified until a couple years later. Um, you know, calling a game was still you know a like you could go about that as more of an old school way, and then seeing what it's transitioning to now. Um, and every club's different. You know, I learned a lot, you know, going back with Carl in Cleveland than what we were doing in Tampa. So you can see where stuff changes. But when I got up there, I felt pretty confident. That, and, and honestly, when I first got called up, um, I should go back and say it like that 2013 season, it was actually good. You know, like I was, I was hitting well. And then I broke my handmate bone in July. And I think I came back in like 22 days. It was like, young you know green like hey like i want to show these guys i'm tough i want to be the catcher of the future and like i look back and i'm like man like i think we were like 15 games out of first place 16 games out and i was like man if i would have just taken my time because little do i know you know that injury happening late in the season and rushing back hurts you know your your overall you know whether it's your strength going into the off season or how you're going to feel hitting what like all these little things that you change you know were we're creatures of manipulation just to be able to get through a game or get through that bat. And you know, now looking back, you know, as a 22 year old kid, you know, I was doing what I thought was right. I can't blame that. But when I tell guys now, and I'm like, look, if it takes you an extra week, an extra 10 days, you know, two weeks, just do that. You know, like we will, we will patch gap it. We will be fine. Um, but you know, that's something that could affect something way further down the road. So you you mentioned that that battle early on, especially when you are kind of rushed to the big that quickly and you are, you know, the high draft pick. Oh, I got to be the catcher of the future. It takes a few years. You have the injuries, but then it really starts to, you know, come together in 2016, 2017. A lot is made of that trip to Tacoma. Uh, this is something that I, I remember, of course, remember very vividly. This is really when, you know, I'm tweeting Mike Zanino is good, you know, three times a week. This is really when it's picking up, okay? I'm curious, as you reflect on that time, was there one moment, was there one hitting meeting, was there one adjustment that you kind of unlocked something offensively where it was like, okay, I'm starting to figure something out? Because, of course, you know, in 2014, it's not like you weren't hitting home runs, but it really started to come together a little bit more completely offensively at that point. Yeah, that was um, a lot of factors that went into that. And I think there was a lot of built-up, you know, tension. You know, I had, you know different hitting coach. I mean, I had four or five different hitting coaches, you know, so I got to a place where it was like, I was with the organiz- organization I was drafted by and I was just looking for, you know, some type of stability in terms of what I was going to do in, in making swing adjustments. Um, instead of just trying to swing, until I found something in the cage. Well, I got sent down and, um, down, I ended up working with Mike Micucci, who was the field coordinator at the time, and he was in charge of catchers in spring training. And it was a guy that I really trusted. And um, he sort of broke it down in an interesting standpoint. He was like, look, he's like, I'm not saying you run at the same rate. I'm not saying you do certain things at the same rate. He's like, but let's look at your athleticism in the batter's box and let's compare it to somebody. Like your athleticism and your strength. And the first person he pulled out was like Mike Trout. And I started laughing. And I was like, get, get out of here. Like, he's like no he's like i'm like i'm being serious like if we're going into the batter's box and we're just asking you to do a task he's like like i'm not asking you what you're going to do once you leave the batter's box he's like i'm just (laughs) saying like in that batter's box what do you like like who can we compare you to and i was like okay and i and i just it was the first time where i was like i'm just gonna pound questions and it sort of came out to the you know the sort of the the scissor type thing i was trying to neutralize my my back leg i was trying to be able to get some type of block into um my front hip you know i was the term almost being too athletic my hips were rotating too fast um so it was finding a way to do that you know you see guys do it you see the altuves you see trout and it's becoming more um you know talked about and um so i went down there and he, he had a set of drills up and um I remember doing front toss literally on, we did T work. They had T work in the cage, went to the field, went back to the cage. He was like, do you want to, he's like, do you want to like not play today? I'm like, no, I'm not staying here for long. Like I, I refused to like, it'd be like a month thing. 
So I played that game and after I DH after every at bat, we would go back up and we just pound in these drills. But I remember the first time I went and did front toss, he was like hit a line drive like over the second base. I mean, I absolutely pounded a ball and I was like, okay, like that that will that would be something. So I ended up doing, I think I was in maybe 10 days. And um I'll never forget this. Once I got called back up, uh, I had a conversation with Danny Valencia. And I don't know if you remember that stretch. Danny was Danny was really struggling too. And he ended up going through a stretch. I think he got 12 consecutive hits and 12 at bats. And he pulled me aside. He said, Look, he goes, if I could do it, he's like, you can do it. Take one at bat at a time. You know, and it was the first time I took the foot off the gas and just challenged myself to have one pitch at a time, one at bat at a time, be stubborn in my approach. And um, I mean, it clicked. I mean, arguably 2017 was the best year of my career. If you look at average home runs, um, you know, and I got away from it a little bit in 18. <laughs> Literally, the, the day before spring, I blow my oblique out. And uh, I had a great spring, and I just couldn't get back to it. And then I really didn't get back to it until – probably the off season of going into 2020. So it was, well, uh, it was, a, yeah, it, it was a crazy ride, but I mean, I remember those days like yesterday and those are the guys you appreciate those conversations, you know, seven, eight years later and the time and the effort that either veterans are talking to you about or coaching uh, is helping you with. Like those are the ones you remember because you know, the, the on pouring of support guys are trying to do. 2017 he's the second best catcher in baseball it's it's no offense but buster posey was a little bit better um i don't know if you're familiar with his work but he was all right um but like yeah, yeah like you were, you were raking like it, this was uh, this was about as good as like a cat a catcher was that season you know and it, i think it, it must be cool for you to look back and be like if x hadn't gone this way if i had had this consistent approach if these injuries like you did it you fulfilled the expectations you performed yeah. at the level that you expected from yourself within the confines of yeah. one season. Yeah. And I think the biggest reward of that, I think I was hitting like one, 160 something with like a hundred at bats. I think I ended up over 250. And I remember, I think it was the second, the last game of the season was the first time I got over the 250 mark. And then I got over there and, and, and Scott after that, like he took me out of the game. And he was like, hey, you're not playing tomorrow either. I think going back to that hotel room, it was in Anaheim. I remember it clear that I sat there and I took the biggest sigh of relief. And I was like, what just happened? Like it was, it was just a stretch that, you know, going into March and April, like it was, or excuse me, April and into May, like it seemed unfathomable. But, the, and I tell guys that now, you know, it's like we put so much weight on a stretch of at bats, but like once you've done something like that, you know, it may not be repeated, but you understand it's possible. And, uh, you know, that little bit of, of knowledge and hope in, in the long term of a season is, is what really can get guys through. It's clear that you have such a strong, you know, vivid recollection of so many of these individual small moments um, so that we could go out, we could be pulling out random games from 2018 that I'm sure you could recall. But I do want to move a little bit more forward towards, again, you, you mentioned more injuries kind of make that next season a little bit more challenging. And then the trade happens. And I'm curious with Tampa Bay, like that that was a big, a, a massive deal for you. I imagine personally, of course, getting to go back closer to home. But from an organizational standpoint, it sounds like you really then had, not a second win is a bad way to put it, but like the all-star season comes in 21, right? 2020, you hit four homers in the postseason. I mean, the 2020 postseason is probably its own podcast on its own, <laughs> I, <laughs> I imagine. So, I, But I am curious for, for your, your tenure in Tampa Bay, what are the things that, that really stand out about how you kind of found another gear there, you know, being an all-star? And there's some crazy stats about some of the power numbers you put up in 2021. Yeah, so I mean, I 2019, you know, I'm catching um, – I ended up getting hurt. I think we got we had three guys, maybe four catchers get hurt in Tampa, and uh, we trade for Darno and uh, like Tra Trav's the man. Uh, he comes over, got DFA'd or let go by the Mets, goes over to the Dodgers. Then we trade for him because we needed somebody, and he went off. You know, so it was to a point. Even when I came back, you know, he had taken the reins, and uh, it was something where you know it was for the first time in my career where I was just like, man, like we're in, we're with a team, like let's win. Like, and I wasn't, I put the personal stuff and, you know, I always just wanted to win, but it was always so harped upon. Like I felt like there was always a little bit more that I wanted to prove, you know, 
with the home crowd in Seattle, that the team that drafted me and invested so much in me. Then I got to Tampa and I've had conversations with these guys and expressed the value that they see in me. And I was like, well, let's just continue to bring that value. And, you know, I started making some changes towards the end of that season. And then 20, 2020 comes or the off season going into 2020. And uh, Eric Neander calls me and, we, you know, we reach a, uh, we reach a deal. And um, he's like, but I'd like you to come in and, you know, meet with some of our, you know, biomechanists and all this stuff. And let's, let's get, let's sort of get some evals on everything. So I, I went down there, did some stuff, sort of found where my body was, you know, where like, how, how can I ship my quads off from catching and, you know, really get into my glutes and be stable and do a bunch of stuff like that. And um, I, I did that. I went this spring. And again, 2020 had a great spring and then COVID happened. And I was like, damn. So I'm, I'm at home, you know, I'm, I got a net. I got, I got a machine spitting foam balls at me as fast as they can. I'm trying to hang on to these swing changes I made, you know, like the guy I was working out with that, um, all, all this information of what I was doing, like, couldn't really go see him. Didn't know when we were coming back. So I was just trying to keep that in stock, like everything, you know, in a good motion, we come back, you know, took me almost, almost until the playoffs back to where I was. And uh, I think that was just the continued, uh, you know, repetition and everything. And then, you know, it's funny how you come in and stretch a good playoffs and, you know, still get, you know, end up having, an, I had an option on the end of the 2020 contract, got that declined because of the financial issues of COVID and then reached another small deal with that big escalator contract and option uh, for Tampa. But uh, that 2020 playoffs really propelled me into a really good off season and a really good uh, mental state to go into 2021. All right. So 2021, this is a great, unbelievable, historic season because you hit 33 homers in 375 plate appearances, which is the third. Basically, it's like, the fewest plate appearances to get to 30 homers. It's the third fewest in MLB history. Okay. So it's McGuire, Mitch Garver in 2019, and then you in 2021, 33 homers, 375 plate appearances. So when you're like, what is that experience like? Because when, when we talk to catchers or players who don't play every day, the overwhelming sense that I get is it's really difficult to stay in rhythm when you're only getting a certain amount of plate appearances a week. Whereas you somehow kept the rhythm going through 375 plate appearances. Well, I mean, I, I remember that completely because, I mean, my years in Tampa, or excuse me, my years in Seattle, you know, I was catching in the 120s. I think I had yeah, one yeah. almost close to the 130s. So, like, the volume was there. But then, like, Tampa, you know, I mean, Tashi, Tashi and those guys are amazing. They know when to give you a break. That, you know, and, and it kept me fresh, but it got to a point when I was feeling really good and I was getting frustrated because I was like, man, like, just keep throwing me out. Like I can do it. Like, just keep throwing me out there. Yeah. And then I think I was talking to my agent one time. He's like, have you ever seen your numbers? Like after you have an off day? And I'm like, no. And it was like, I, I was hitting like 500 with X amount of my homers, like <laughs> after I had been given a day off. So then I was like, I wasn't looking for days off, but I was like, all right, like my, my mindset changed. I got my, my body taken care of. I got, you know what I needed to done in the cage. And then I would go in there and I had this, this confidence of where it used to, like if I had something going good, and I had an off day. It was like, damn, like, how am I going to hold on to this? And then my mental like state shifted to like, all right, sweet. Like I know what I need to do to, you know, get ready for this next day and then go catch three more in a row or catch four in a row. And uh, I, I give credit to those guys. I mean, they lay out your playing schedule in advance. So, you know, like you, 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 you are fully prepared of what you're going to go do that week. And, and, you know, as a player, that's all you can ask for. Let's, um, let's stick on the homers here for a second. Uh, you hit a lot of them, not just 2021. What home runs stand out when you're thinking? I mean, it seems like you probably remember 90% of them based on your recall that you're describing. But, you know, you had a couple walk-offs in there. You, of course, had some postseason ones. You had some of the farthest home runs that we've seen in Major League Baseball over the last 10 years. Well, are there any individual ones that, that stand out to you that you look back on or, or go back and watch the highlights of because they're especially uh, memorable? I mean, I can, you know, like you said, I could, I could rattle off a bunch. I think you don't really think about it until done or you know, 
somebody asked you this question, but it's one of those things where going back to like my first career home run, like I remember like not sure if I believe it was Coco Crisp but robbed it or not. I, <laughs> yep, I had no Oakland. idea. Yep, I remember. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, obviously the walk-off home runs, um, you know, the one I hit against, I believe it was uh, Kinsler. Yep, um, Kinsler. They were both the against right, Minnesota, weirdly. Yeah, yeah. The, the one the one to right center was one of those where like, I went up there with an approach. I knew he backdoored the two seam. I was trying to just stay inside of something and drive it that way. And it, and it worked out. Um, you know, the one against the grand slam against Cobb, I think that gave me like eight or nine RBI, something like that, that game. Um, but that was, that was probably the farthest one I fit in Safeco. Um, and then going to, going to Tampa, the biggest one was obviously the, the couple I hit against, um, uh, McCullers, just the one I hit in game seven was just, the same scenario. I mean, he was peppering me in a spot and he was throwing his breaking ball and it was sharp and I was just shifting my sights up and uh, I found a couple heaters off up in the zone that were like mid nineties. And I just finally got, you know, a hanging breaking ball right where I was looking. It was like just, just getting and competing to get to that. I believe it was a three, two count or two, two count and putting that swing on it. And that scenario was just, you know, game seven was a little weight lift off the shoulders. I was like, all right, let's just go out and win this game because, uh, you know, in, in those scenarios, you just never, you never know what's going to happen. It was, you know, my first taste of the playoffs. I didn't play in the playoffs in 19. And, um, you know, it, it was just cool to hit and, and do things like that in such big games. You are now retired. You now get to hang out with your family and your kids. But you did mention there, you know, something also I'm always interested in with guys who retire is like, are you just going to never watch baseball? But from our conversation, that does not seem to be the case. So what is what is next? I know it's early. You just announced this. I don't know if you have you know imminent plans to get right back into the game. But what do you think this first year is going to look like in terms of Mike Zanino, the baseball fan? Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, um, one of those things I'm excited. To, I mean, the game's still as exciting as it ever has been to me. Um, you know, the talent in the league, what's going on. Like I'm, I'm excited to watch it and be able to follow more. I mean, I think sometimes you get so blinded by either who you're playing or what's going on on your team. You miss some of the other things going on in the, in the sport. Um, but yeah, for me, you know, I'm going to enjoy this time with family, continue to, uh, you know, get to a spot where my body feels great and, uh, you know, recovering from that career. Um, but you know, like we don't live, we don't live far outside the, you know, the city of Gainesville. So, you know, I, I go in and, you know, talk to the guys there at UF some, you know, and, and I don't know what could arise at the, you know, you know, it, with, with the ranks of the major leagues, you know, I, I have, I have intrigue with a lot of stuff, you know, I've the, the, the catching and pitching side of it, um, is huge for me. Uh, you know, I could go in and tell guys pretty much not to do it at the plate a lot of the times, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things where I have. I have intrigued just to, just to listen to a bunch of stuff. You know, you see guys going and, you know, maybe become special assistants or do stuff and just sort of learn more of the ins and outs and see which way they may uh, prefer to go. But it's something that, you know, has, has been a keen interest to me. And uh, I'll just take it as it comes. And in that time, just, you know, enjoy being a fan. Well, it seems like you are uh, you're in a pretty good spot, pretty healthy position. Uh, very much looking forward to seeing what is next for Mike Zanino. Um, we are very excited for you and, and very grateful that you gave us uh, all this time. I know that we have uh, been indirectly associated with your career <laughs> Jordan, for the goofiest of reasons. <laughs> let me just ask I know our, quickly, our dear friend. I want to ask quickly yeah. before we let Mike oh, yeah. go. I want to ask you, Jordan, yeah. when you started tweeting Mike oh, Zanino yeah. is good. <laughs> yeah. I need this backstory, yeah, like, too. I, I, I don't want to ask as the, the, the interviewee. I got but you. I want to, I know. I, you I, I it's did. only fair. You've give, we've asked you enough questions. <laughs> like, Jordan, there are many baseball players, some of whom, mm -hmm. no offense, Mike, were better than Mike. Okay. What was <laughs> it about Mike? I never tweeted Buster Posey was good. That's the thing. I, well, I guess everyone so. kind of knew that. <laughs> like, I guess my question for you, Jordan, is what about Mike mm -hmm. within the context of the Mariners mm -hmm. at that time and his game? made you want to start tweeting out Mike Zunino is good every single time he hit a homer. Yes. So I would say that, again, like the timing of all of it was was very important. And I think, again, Mike, to give you background just on me personally in the, the 10 second version, like I really became a Mariners fan because of Felix Hernandez. Um, this was not something I had no Pacific Northwest ties. So it was really Felix was my favorite pitcher. And he really got me to start watching the Mariners all the time. And that really began like watching every day in 2013. Right. So like as you're getting drafted and coming up and like watching watching your career and watching it, the ups and downs of it, once it started to all come together, and especially when we were all learning about 
the things we referenced, catcher framing, catcher defense, understanding what it means to be a catcher and the value that the catchers provide beyond the batting average. It was kind of a, it became a, a reason to be like, no, 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 like this guy is good. I don't care that he's hitting 200. <laughs> like it was really that simple. And I think it was something that a lot of people, baseball fans and people who are more sabermetrically inclined start to realize like to what it means to be a good catcher is so much more than one stat or anything. And then obviously once you're hitting 250 with, with slugging 600, then it's a lot easier to do it anyway. <laughs> but it was really that whole thing and the appreciation of the catcher position, the fact of everything that you've kind of gone through at the beginning of your career with the injuries, with the being sent down, it really in that, that narrative of being sent down and called back up and it all coming together, I was like, it's happening. He, and we all have to accept it. He is good. I know we've been waiting for it, but it is happening. And so that's really the the gist of it. And, and obviously, I'm very fortunate that you indirectly not being on social media, bless your heart, um, <laughs> good has, uh, good has, 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 to, has been a good sport about it because I, I understand – that at some point, I imagine your your lovely wife uh, let you know about this. But I don't know. I'm curious when you started to find out, too, honestly. I mean, the first time I heard, I think it was like PR guys at the Mariners. Like, have you heard about this? And I was <laughs> like, I've been off since like 2012. I got no idea. Uh, but they started saying it. And then you started like like some people around like like the stands and stuff like that were like, they, whether it was like shirts or whatever. And I was like, I, wh what the hell is going on? And um, but no, it's one of those things, like all the things you said, you know, it's one of those full, full circle things, you know, for me, if, you know, there wasn't those struggles in some of those times, you know, I don't think I dive as deep, you know, into maybe the catching position, the defensive side of it, uh, you know, the, the game calling, the importance of pitcher catcher relationships, you know, it's a, there's so much that gets touted on the offensive numbers. Um, and the, I think that sometimes the hardest thing with young catchers and, and to implement with them is, is how do you learn your guys? What do they do well? And how can you navigate them through a game? You know, and, um, you know, I wanted to do that. You know, it, it's not easy when you're a, a 22 year old kid and, you know, it's Felix and Joe Saunders and Hasashi Wakuma, and you're just sitting there and you're like, man, these guys are established veterans, you know, but if I show them that I am willing to put them first and how can I do that? So, like I said, during that time, you know, Funny, I didn't know much about it. I always wanted the backstory as we ran into each other in <laughs> spring training fields and stuff like that. But um, like I said, going back to that part of it, you know, change any of that because I think what I've learned through those years and what I can help people with now um, in that part of the game was, was solely correlated with, you know, some of the struggles, but it also let me dive deeper into certain aspects of the game. Well, oh, man. Mike, Mike Zanino, good player, good person, good podcast guest. I have no, I have, I mean, I have a hundred more questions, but you have uh, uh, your, your retirement to, to go enjoy. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Enjoy retirement. Best to your family. Thank you for everything that you've done for, for us as goofy baseball fans and baseball internet creators. Uh, and uh, congratulations on an incredible career, Mike. We really, we really appreciate the time. Thank you guys. I appreciate you having me. Enjoy doing nothing. And welcome back to the end of this episode of Baseball Barbacast. Jake Mintz, Jordan Schusterman, no longer Mike Zunino. Maybe he'll come back at some point during the season and update us on his retirement. We're very appreciative that Mike Z made the time uh, and just kind of a cool pinch yourself fun thing. Like yes. our jobs are stupid and weird and we grow up and become slightly more professional over time. Uh, but whenever we get the opportunity to, to do something like that with someone who has meant something <laughs> yes. to us is cool. Yes. So even if you were like, what the hell are they talking about? Who's Mike Sanino? Why does anyone care about him? Hopefully you enjoyed that conversation. Now we, we hinted, we said to Mike, Oh, what are you going to do in retirement? Well, there's a lot of options. He could do anything, right? We said, Oh, is this Mike Z going to stick around baseball? Well, one option for Mike Sanino is to join our baseball barbacast fantasy league. I don't know if he's going to, we'll see, uh, we'll have to follow up with him. But if you want to join the first ever Baseball Barbacast Fantasy League. Email us. Let us know why you should be in the league. Baseballbarbacast at gmail.com. It will, of course, yeah. be on Yahoo Sports. You can sign up for Fantasy Baseball right now at Yahoo. Yahoo.com slash Fantasy Baseball or on the Yahoo Fantasy app. We are going to, I think, probably Monday. So Jake and I are actually going to be in the same place on Monday. I'm going to be in New York. Uh, so we're going to be recording some pods in person. But on Monday, we will announce when the draft will be we have received some yeah. incredible, <laughs> incredible submissions. Again, I, how many uh, people being like, yeah, I'm, I'm around 24 seven. You want to draft at 3 a.m.? Sounds good. Oh, this is why I should be in the league. Like, it's so funny. You people are, are incredible. Let us know. Yeah. Keep letting us know why you should be in the league. <laughs> 
maybe Jordan, we do a pod or some content around our favorite responses yes. and pick the people who will be in the league. Right. Um, I am very excited. Uh, uh, let me let me just gonna, say this. Let me just say this. Ahead. It's very much making yeah. me want to do a twelve team at least instead of a ten team because I want to make sure we oh, get yeah. as many of these people uh, as possible. So thank you all for listening. Can we do? Again. Can we yeah. like do like three catchers? Oh my god! <laughs> I think a four catcher AL only league. Who says no? Uh, everybody. Uh, thank you all for listening. Baseball at gmail.com. Thank you to Mike Tanino. Thank you to Andrew Hartz and Brett Rader for making this episode possible. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow on Friday with our American League West preview. Uh, but until then, uh, enjoy. Thank you all. Padres fans, you have Dylan Cease. White Sox fans, you're going to be really bad. All right. Bye. White Sox fans, you have Jerry Reinsdorf.